Hi, I'm Melvin Way. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I bought one of these Grow Your Own Giant Joshua Tree packets with seeds that are ready to go. They're quite interesting. They're black, like little flattened discs. They're fairly big. The Joshua Tree itself is very big. And I'm going to cut this open. I bought this in a Death Valley gift store. So it comes with its own little pot. You know, um, I'm not going to follow any of these instructions because, uh, yeah, I have my own pots over there. I'm going to use a self-watering pot. But this thing says blah, 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 11 to 21 days. You'll get something. Here are the seeds. Let me put away my scissors. But yeah, they have these tiny little pots in each one of these kinds of kits, and I've never liked them. I've never liked this stuff. It's very light and spongy form. It's kind of like vermiculite or whatever. Uh, that doesn't even resemble desert soil of any kind. High desert California soil, Nevada soil, Arizona soil, etc. So let's see. So yeah, I've grown things from this before. This uh, all-purpose manual covers a lot of things. Joshua tree is not a cactus, but is yet another hardy plant that has acquired a remarkable relationship with the relentless desert. The Joshua tree grows sporadically in the Mojave and Sonoran deserts of Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and Southern, uh, Southern California in the United States. It's a member of the Yucca genus. You know, they have tough sword-shaped leaves, clusters of white flowers. I bet it's pollinated by the, the yucca moth, too, or some uh, subspecies of it. So, let's see. 11 to 21 days of germination. You know, uh, the tree can actually get to way taller than that, maybe 50 feet or 15 meters. I have a video of a very special tree and a video of Joshua trees in general. So uh, Mormons encounter these and sometimes use them for firewood and you know it has a religious naming so let's see that's basically it and I'm going to plant all these seeds but first I'm going to sterilize some potting mix. Alright so my first order of business is to use this Miracle Grow potting mix uh, grows plants twice as big, feeds up to six months, blah blah blah. They ran out of the moisture control blue packaging one, so this is what I bought instead. It's pretty much all the same stuff. And you know, they have a analysis on, let's see, the nutrients. It's not focusing. Let's see, not very detailed. I'm sure this has basically everything in it. It has a lot of wood chips in my experience. So I'm going to rip this along a perforated edge, which uh, they always conveniently provide. It's a very uh, corporate product. And I'll fill these trays. I got two of them. Because one of them typically wasn't enough to sterilize the entire volume of soil in my oven. Alright, so that's basically it. I'm going to put these in my oven and bake the soil for quite a while. All right, here's my oven setup. I have my two trays of potting mix. I already preheated it. Coils are all red. And it's at 350 Fahrenheit, which means uh, about 177 Celsius. So I'm going to keep it there for maybe over an hour. Let it cool down, and hopefully there's still some sunlight I can plant. All right, so it's overcast, but we still have some time left in the day. I let these tins of soil cool down for an hour so it should be safe you know it's slightly warm inside um, it's kind of moist actually but I'm gonna start doing this And 
And here are the Joshua tree seeds. So I can bury them at different depths and whatnot, but you know, uh, yeah, it's just good to have some variety in case, uh, you know, one depth works out better than another, but the other form of variety just comes in, you know, the seeds themselves and how they're going to react to these conditions. So hopefully out of all these seeds, you know, some deeper than others by maybe an inch or so, some just by one centimeter. Um, we can have some that grow. You can just put some over the top. This soil feels unexpectedly moist too, so I don't think I really need to do all that much in terms of watering. But yeah, that's a good start. And then I can just move this whole thing, you know, over to some place where it gets a lot of afternoon sun. And water just a little bit. I know by watering, everything shifts around, but... More or less, the stuff that was deeper should still be deeper and so forth. Stuff that's shallow will still be more shallow on average. Alright, it's day 21. And if you look very, very closely, I do have progress. So it's at the end of the range of, what was it, 11 to 21 days. But basically, let me focus. If you look over there. Looks like a, you know, blade of grass sticking out, and it's actually hard to see, but if you look over there, you've got one too, so let me get this in good light. Yeah, so it looks like we have at least two Joshua trees. This soil was really dried out at the top. I underestimated how much water I would need in my fear of overwatering, but um, I would say just go for it, you know, really pour on the water from the top. And yesterday I also watered, I filled up the watering tray and it seems to be empty already. Let me see if I can get that in better light, yeah. So there's nothing in there. And I'm expecting several others to pop up as well, but this is a great start to this series. All right, it's day 23 of this series. It's been two days since I first saw some sprouts. And that second needle coming out is folded. I've been calling these needles, but they're not really needles. I mean, get another look later, but you have the same thing going on there with the second one coming out. These things are basically like folded up blades of grass, as you can see. Like a little canoe over there that's very green. Um, not quite as succulent as I had suspected. So we'll see how this goes after a few more days. All right, it's day 27 of this Joshua Tree series. You can see these leaves are much bigger. They're maybe uh, three centimeters plus for this one. And that one's maybe just two centimeters. And, you know, this other stuff that's sticking out, it's having a hard time popping out. So I don't know what that is yet, but uh, the ground's looking a little parched. It's finally a sunny day. We've had a lot of days of May gray. So I'm going to pour some water in there and ameliorate the situation. And hopefully that will cause other seeds to germinate, but if not, It'll at least ensure that these don't dry out since the roots are probably still very underdeveloped and shallow. All 
All right, I just put this pot back on my balcony floor and I watered, that caused shifting. And I see that there's another shoot. So we have at least three out of 15 germinating. I suppose I could spray water, but you know, that doesn't seem to help flatten things out either. So I hope, you know, this pouring of water doesn't destroy some seedlings by turning them upside down. Because if they've already started growing upwards due to gravitropism, that would be really bad. It'd take a really long time for them to recover. All right, it's day 31 of this Joshua Tree series. We do have progress, but, you know, we still have this thing where it's sort of like, you know, bean sprout or whatever, just barely coming out of the soil. Not quite sure what the deal is with that you know, hairpin loop that never goes away. You know, we got that for all three of these. And I don't know how long it's going to take for whatever that curl is to pop out. So it's been 10 days since the last update. And it's still like this. They're just like described, uh, blades of grass. So um, not quite what I pictured. Joshua trees would look like early on, but that's what makes this series so interesting. So the sturt sprout in the center has the most enviable positioning in the pot, but as you can see, these first two movers are way bigger in development, if not just for only the cotyledon or whatever. You know, I don't know what are true leaves now and what aren't at this stage. But I would think that these two first movers will take over the pot just due to having that first mover advantage. It's day 34 of this Joshua Tree growing series. As you can see that third shoot in the middle, it's got that pronounced hairpin structure. And it comes out of a sleeve that kind of runs diagonally out of the soil. But you can see for, you know, that that one over there on the left, a uh, new leaf is coming out between the hairpin and the existing leaf, which looks like a folded up blade of grass or a furled blade of grass. And this second one that I'm looking at in the center here, it hasn't had that level of development yet, nor is it as tall. You know, maybe that's uh, 10 centimeters tall. That's like seven or something like that. So yeah, not quite what I expected. I just watered a little bit. This soil always seems dry being in such a small pot. And in this, just having Southern California afternoon sun dries everything out and makes the pot feel really lightweight. So I'm gonna water a little bit more. I mean, I'm probably shifting stuff around, but I, I think these Joshua trees can handle it. It's day 48 of this Joshua tree growing series. And I don't know if you can see that, but if you look there, this thing is kind of withered away. You know, uh, I don't really know what this thing does. You know, it's a hairpin. It's kind of shriveled up at the end. Maybe it's too dry. Maybe it's supposed to die like that. Uh, don't really notice anything for this one here. These things have more rigidity now. Um, but they're not quite as rigid as pine needles or anything like that. And these uh, oldest leaves are all about 12 centimeters tall. Well, they're oldest if you don't count little things like that hairpin. And I don't really even see that feature anymore for the other two ones. But um, yeah, right here, um, you can see a little green loop coming out. That's another plant. And let's see, right here, you can see this little green hair coming out, right green. So we have at least five plants. Uh, this pot feels very light again. I'm gonna start watering copiously. So let me take this down. Yeah, so. I don't know if this gives you a better viewing of that and that. But 
seems like these small pots run out of water really fast. So you just gotta be generous and go top down as heavy as possible. But without turning everything upside down, of course. See, it looks like there might have been a little shift in the soil there. And this is more exposed now. You can try to compensate, but it's never going to be perfect, you know. So, yeah, I'm going to get it slightly buried. So, just to make sure everything has more support. Of course, there were probably... Yeah, there were 15 seeds in the beginning. So, 5 out of 15 isn't too bad, but it's been like 48 days already. That's a really long time. So, for whatever reason, positioning, genetic variation, you know, some just are way slower to sprout into action and germinate than the others. All right, it's day 69. These things grow slower than molasses. They still look like three blades of grass each, except for the fourth one that has only two blades, a very small initial one, and then a much broader, thicker, uh, curled over one. It's at the side of the pot. It's not a optimal position compared to the other three positions. So I hope it turns out okay. I have this layer of sand and diatomaceous earth. It's about maybe 95% sand, 5% diatomaceous earth on top. I did that to uh, kill the fungus gnats that were passing out of my potting mix and spawning constantly, feeding off the fungus in the wet potting mix below. I haven't watered for about three weeks, and although the edge has cracked a little bit and maybe moisture and fungus gnats can still get out through there. I think um, not watering for three weeks has definitely helped. Um, these are high desert Mojave desert plants, succulents, so they shouldn't need that much water at this point with very little leaf surface area and by letting this pot dry out Hopefully that deprives the fungus gnat larvae of their food and deters them from laying more eggs in there and uh, spawning continuously. So I haven't seen that many fungus gnats um, lately. Alright, it's day 93 of this series. I got this little lazy Susan on the bottom or whatever you want to call these things. Turntable with ball bearings and it can support 25 kilos of weight so that'll basically be good for all my plants and I'll get a table to put this on but as you can see there's not that much growth it's been brutally hot and dry here in San Diego for July uh, right now it's August 4th the beginning of August and as you can see the sand you know when it gets really dry you know you get those cracks um, I guess my fungus gnat problem is solved, but, you know, that just wicks away moisture, I think, and this thing is probably all just dried out. That's why, you know, the, this tip is just dead looking. Maybe it's having trouble competing with the other two main plants. Uh, now that tip, uh, I don't know if I can get a good view on that. Let me try to focus in the dark. You know, it's not looking too good. That leaf looks wider. I guess there's some growth, but it's not great. So uh, what I'm gonna do is you know, just get my bottle of distilled water and basically water from the bottom. I don't like watering um, from the top because that soaks the sand. I'm gonna water and filled this several times um, maybe one or two more times until no more water can go in and these things should have roots deep enough by now I mean they're high desert plants they should be really mercilessly efficient at absorbing water but you know I don't like how these tips have turned a little burnt maybe it's just because I've been neglecting the water thinking these are desert plants so they don't need any water for the entire summer but you know I'm gonna add some sand to fill up these cracks 
Haven't seen any fungus gnats for a long time, but haven't really seen any growth either. Maybe it's tied together. Maybe the fungus gnat larvae uh, have chewed at the roots, the root hairs of these plants. So we'll see what happens. Um, since growth is slow, I don't see the need to transplant anything or cull anything yet. All right, it's day 120 of this Joshua Tree series. Um, one plant is doing particularly well, and the others are kind of burned or have some leaves that are burning. It's kind of hard for you to see here, but uh, focus on that. You, know, you can see that's kind of a burned dead leaf, the new leaf that's coming out you know, in the middle there. Barely see it. You know, it's in a shadow. That's dying too. Uh, these leaves are dying even though I don't know how the rest of this stuff hangs on for so long. This one looks like this leaf could be healthy. Try to focus on that. Although this uh, little leaf here is dead. That thing has barely made any progress. So you know I think there's probably some mechanism of biological warfare going on between these siblings and you know the best plant you know basically wins out and kills everything else through you know chemicals that inhibit the growth or even kill the other plants you know, around it so I'm gonna try to do a transplant and you know definitely I want to keep this plant intact but I'm gonna get things to go in this pot over here you know where I had some of my ginger plants it has nice drainage a lot of sand and some diatomaceous earth mixed in and also I have a pot over here I can move both of these to be in the sun but yeah basically if I don't make a move soon I think I'll just have one plant and who knows if that's even a guarantee to survive all right so let's do this it's gonna be a little bit messy <sighs> Hope I don't destroy everything in this process. Hmm. Well, that just is dead anyway. So. Yeah, it's probably easier just to do that and hope for the best. So the roots grew all the way to the bottom. This is the big plant. Hope I didn't hurt it too much. We did a pretty good job it seems. And we can deal with all this strenuous dirt later, but yeah, that's what a Joshua tree plant looks like. It has very deep roots. Sort of looks like an onion bulb, you know. I may have no, I don't think I broke anything. So yeah, this thing can get one pot all to itself. Soil down here is sort of moist. Um, it's kind of hard to get this thing to go the way I want it to go, but
Maybe I can have it a little higher in there, but you know, I don't want to break anything. Try to really reach in there and lift up this stuff, but uh, yeah, Wouldn't be too reckless. Yeah, this thing is a goner. Kind of broke off. You know, it's it's dead. There's no roots connecting it. And if take a look at what I emptied out of that bucket. Let me focus on that. And you got one healthy plant, and the roots go all the way to the bottom. And then you got one other plant, which is kind of stuck there too, but this root bulb looks really unhealthy. It's brown, you know, it's not quite like that. So, you know, even this one has a little bit of trouble. So I'm just going to plant this one in that pot. Rescue what I can, and see if... Alright, so I'm back again. As you can see, these roots go real deep. You know, that's why I was all tangled in the pot and I was uh, kind of afraid I was gonna break them. I don't know if that's in focus. It's kind of hard to tell outside, but I'm gonna bury that in here. And it looks like, you know, I didn't see any signs of fungus gnats. Maybe this is just root rot from you know, that stuff sitting down there where the soil is all soaking wet. Because the composition of what was in that pot is just, you know, largely really wet potting mix. And let's see. Yeah, I can see some fungus gnats flying out of here. sprinkle in some sand but yeah these roots are so long So that's the compromised plant with possible root rot. This is the healthier, much bigger plant. Maybe it was just saved by being closer to the side of the pot. But you know, here's my watering can. Um, you can tell it's a little unstable because you know it's not tightly packed. They didn't want to ruin the roots or anything like that. But yeah, I'll just water like that and let it soak in. That should provide for its needs. Needs. There's not that much water in here. And regarding that other one, it doesn't really need extra water. As you can see, the dirt's already wet. It was in the shade this entire time. It, that's why there were fungus gnats, you know, when I was digging around in there. So that's it. You know, I'm just going to cover these with some sand to control the fungus gnat problem. And we'll see what happens after a few weeks. All right, so I still have my Joshua trees in these pots and prime positions on the ground. On my balcony, it's day 177, I believe. And I can pick this up, put it on the observation deck, and, you know, kind of spin it around to get a better look. But this other plant... Most of the leaves are dying. You know, the root rot just overcame everything. Uh, I haven't watered since the transplant, but I'm thinking there's still some hope that it can recover. And for this other one, you know, it's got one dead leaf, but uh, a new leaf, so it's definitely growing. Here it is on the observation deck. You know, there's that dead leaf. Uh, root rot can be brutal. And there is a new leaf. You know, it's uh, maybe just two and a half centimeters long. It's good news. It means this plant is on track towards recovery. Only full recovery. I stopped watering. 
ever since the last update. So that root rot should be a thing of the past. Plus the relatively new dry soil surrounding the roots, you know, that'll absorb a lot of the moisture. So there's not that much more to say. It's really hot these days. It's 94 Fahrenheit right now. That's perfectly suited for these Joshua trees, especially for drying out the soil. And this is the kind of temperature that these Joshua trees are acclimated and evolved to dealing with out in the high desert. It's day 233. It's been eight weeks since my last update. As you may well know from watching my other three plant updates. And this leaf in the middle that I'm touching is about... 10 or 11 centimeters long used to be two in the last update this one is just a waste of a pot it retains some greenness despite being dead for you know well since the last update or even earlier due to root rot so it's always amazing to me how you can cut off leaves or stems and have things stay green for a really long time despite having no root system support that looks like a piece of rope instead of a leaf and yeah there's basically nothing to do here I'm still gonna water a little bit um, top down from now on with all my plants because I think that's a better approach rather than just soaking the bottom watering tray and just letting all the soil especially in the bottom be soaking wet for such a long time because there's so little leaf mass surface area here it doesn't really make sense to water copiously and just have everything be sodden underground it's not really how it works in nature although I'm sure in some environments you know if there's bedrock underneath it could happen after a lot of rain uh, it could just accumulate but here's a new leaf in the center so it took that amount of time eight weeks just to get one leaf to grow to nearly full length and get a new one and now that I have a good camera with zoom and macro capabilities you know I can zoom in and see what's going on although there's not a whole lot to see here there's nothing really special the leaves aren't sharp um, the plant still doesn't really resemble anything I saw in Joshua Tree National Park the end tip there is a little brown that happens with a lot of plants but yeah progress has been slow I think I'll keep this if possible in a spot with more light Although I don't have room on my observation table, so I don't know what to do. Alright, it's been a whopping 119 days, or almost 4 months, since the last update. The reason I waited so long to do an update was because I wanted to see if the Joshua Tree would get a little bigger and more impressive. And as you can see, it's not really. It's marginally bigger. I think it has the same number of leaves, uh, one that was kind of withering away back in the day from my last episode is already completely withered and this thing is just growing as slow as molasses I don't know what's wrong I'll show you some footage from a few weeks ago where there was some a little bit of hail we had a lot of rainstorms thunderstorms and since I moved this pot to be full time on top of the observation deck instead of on the back uh, near the sliding door of the balcony it's been getting some of that winter precipitation so I don't know if the the root rot is starting to come back or because as you can see with this kind of hail and sleet going on um, it, if a lot of it blows over the balcony edge due to the wind then the soil is going to get soaked so I've noticed an upsurge of fungus gnats this is again in the present day it's uh, April 2nd 2016 you know we're back to standard uh, great weather in San Diego no more rain Everything's going to start drying up. But you know, I got some ginseng roots and I got some dwarf Cavendish banana seeds and none of that stuff germinated. I'm thinking I should, you know, still keep things simple, but in the future for germination, probably just do the wet paper towel method or some other kind of uh, mode or modicum where I can see what's going on before I throw a bunch of seeds in the soil and water and just wait forever and ever and have nothing happen that's basically what happened you know I I know my YouTube channel has suffered in terms of not having a new plant series this year and it's already April but 
I'm hoping I can get some seeds or find some interesting things to grow and start some new series. You know, because this Joshua Tree series wall, it's the most popular one from my 2015 series. Basically, it's not going anywhere fast. Maybe now that the weather is drier and I'm just watering sparingly once in a while, top down like this, uh, we can get things going again with growth now that it's uh, going to be spring proper and summertime this will get a lot more sunlight per day and the sun will also help dry out the soil and provide more of a natural environment compared to all those freakish uh, winter storms that dump a lot of uh, precipitation onto this sand soil mixture so as you can see there's still not much to report I hope uh, things really start to pick up with seasonality and thank you for watching the series thus far it's gonna go on for a really long time so stay tuned for future episodes it's just that I might not have new episodes come out that frequently because there just simply isn't anything to really report on and I'm not gonna dig this thing up like I did um, early on hi it's Melvin welcome back to my YouTube channel please like my videos and put them on your playlists on your YouTube channels so it's been a long time it's day 375 this is the lone survivor in this long-standing series about growing Joshua trees from seeds and it's been like this for a while you know in the beginning I have four seedlings that kinda of just shot up and they weren't this developed but it looked like tufts of grass they were greener I think back then this is a dark green the base show some red reddish purple with some yellow and at the base you can see two dying leaves so I got kinda of bored with watering with a squirt bottle it takes forever so I just started pouring with a watering can you know with the sand on top to prevent fungus gnats from spawning it's kind of hard to gauge how wet the soil is but I dug my finger in there and it was kinda of dry so eight days later I did some more watering this is the same thing filmed in better lighting although it was overcast nearly every day and especially towards dusk it was just really hard to get a window of opportunity in which I could get some good videography in so I'm just squirting at the base nothing big here not a whole lot of water but this thing has been in stasis for a very long time or diapause stagnation whatever you want to call it so it's day 388 it's one of the rare days in which the sun is finally out this year during late spring 2016 it's just been horrible in May especially so the plant looks healthy enough you know there's a new leaf coming out in the middle it's probably about 30 percent length so this thing is a lot more erect than it was at some points in the past just doing yet another squirt bottle watering at the very base it's actually kind of annoying to have all this sand because at some point last year in 2015 I just knocked a bunch of grains of sand into the core of the plant and then I always see them wedged between the leaves so this is a day of May gray on day 397 classic example I just wanted to show you with my lux meter from two years ago basically how much light this gets on a cloudy day and why there's not that much progress so it's hard to see here due to the glare but it's you know a times 10 at the bottom so that would be 2000 there between the pots you know less than 3000 there and roughly 4000 lux here which is 1 30th of what it would be with direct sunlight you know sometime in the mid-afternoon when my balcony gets sun so that's almost nothing it's day 403 and I'm gonna start my aspirin watering this is an idea given to me by one of my viewers it's cheap enough to execute I chose some low-dose chewable aspirin from Target it's just a generic brand the chewable part comes in for easily dissolving it in water obviously if you have a solid pill that's uh, very dense and you don't crush it it would just take forever so it's set to speed germination prevent root rot protect against bugs 
It gets metabolized in plants to salicylic acid, which induces systemic acquired resistance throughout the plant against disease. So the recommended dosage is one full dose for a gallon of water. That's way too much for my plants. Normally I use a watering can like this that has slightly less than a liter, so it's almost four liters to the gallon, and hence it makes sense to use low dose aspirin, which is one fourth of the dose. So I'm just gonna do a soak here. You can see with my previous watering can attempt, I knocked away a lot of the sand, so it's no longer aesthetic. Sand is uh, scattered everywhere. So on day 410, you know, I'm just getting some macro footage of the leaf tip dying. So I've had this recurring problem where the plant just seems to be recycling its old leaves to make new leaves and I'm not really making any progress. I mean there is some progress. The base looks thicker and whatnot, especially after I removed some of the sand and watered away some of the sand and shoved it to the side. But I'm going to try some macronutrient fertilization with some miracle grow of blue crystals here. So plants need nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in usable compound form and that's what I'm going to give this. I didn't fertilize earlier because the plant was sort of in a sickly state where it's not really making too much progress. It keeps losing leaves way before it should. Actually I don't really know what happens in the wild. Maybe something like this happens if conditions are poor but desert soil is fine and compact with a lot more organic rotting material to perhaps you know fund the plant with macro and micronutrients so I'm just giving this a low dose of these blue crystals that will provide the ni nitrogen phosphorus and potassium for the plant and see what happens I don't want to start off with a very heavy dose also it made sense to do the aspirin first because that's what they say in the online literature so to speak that you know you want to nurse the plant back to health or give it a little bit of systemic acquired resistance to everything. Um, it supposedly does wonders for a plant, but in some cases I think it doesn't do much. So this could be either case. We'll have to give it some time. So day 423, 12 days after the macro fertilization, things look a lot better. The blades are more erect and the plant looks greener. I think we're making finally some headway so it's really hard to tell, you know, what did this? Is it the aspirin or is it the macro fertilization? So I'm just squirting on some aspirin water again. I'm trying to get the foliage to stop this whole rotting away thing. I mean withering away. That's more like what it's doing. So I just keep losing the outermost uh, oldest leaves. And then they curl up like that. Eventually they can be peeled away and that solves the whole problem of grains of sand being stuck in between the base and the, the newer leaves. So there's a newer leaf in the middle. It's about 30% length and it's going to get there someday. So on day 429, I got the idea, you know, well this is just a demo. I actually tried this four days prior to start some vitamin watering. So I was browsing for various potting mixes and you know there are different ones for succulents or desert plants different ones for citrus plants so I was thinking instead of wasting all this money and time and energy buying new potting mixes of various kinds that are advertised for citrus plants or desert plants succulents etc why don't I just crush up some vitamin pills fresh ones that are potent and just dissolve them in water and use that to water my plants to compensate for any nutritional deficiencies they have. So the paper theory of this idea seemed very very solid the more I thought about it and I decided to try this four days ago this would be the second application. So when you put it in a squirt bottle and shake like that you'll notice some stuff on the top on the inside of the bottle is still undissolved that would probably be the indissolvable fat soluble vitamins or other components in there and I think that's perfectly fine because plants don't uptake anything through you know a li lipid or fat interface anyway so why would you care about things that can only dissolve in the presence of fat you would only care about things that dissolve in the presence of water 
So it doesn't look very appetizing. That's basically what happens in your stomach, you know, how it would probably look to some degree. And I'm just going to water at the base. Unlike with chemical fertilizer for the miracle Grow, I'm not really worried about this splattering on the leaves and causing fertilizer burn, although I will do a wash down later. But I just wanted to soak the soil where I think the roots are at. I'm not sure that there's much root growth laterally since I've never watered that way. I'll address that later, but it takes a long time and sometimes the square bottle gets stuck. I'm going to use a spray bottle with distilled water to wash off all the residual vitamin residue. I don't think it would do much. It would probably form a chalky you know, layer or a few water spots here and there on the leaves. But I want to keep this stuff aesthetic and clean so no problems arise. So we'll see if this does anything over the course of the next few weeks. I have high hopes that it will. So this is one of my test subjects. The other would be the century plant, which nobody watches that series. Well, at least not until lately. So I've made these episodes in a longer format, and I think people really like the longer formats better. They want to see better videography and not just see me rush through everything like they did in 2015, back before I had this camera. So the leaf tip dying, I think it hasn't really progressed, although things like this go at a very slow pace, so it's really hard to tell. I hope that can just stop, or at least no additional leaves die. So it's day 435. I'm going to do another vitamin watering in it, crush this one up as finely didn't put in a squirt bottle. But I am watering on the perimeter because I want to address that problem of possible non-root growth in the lateral directions. So as soon as the water hit the side, spouts water stream, I realized, you know, there's all the sand there. So I removed all the sand manually. I should have taken a vacuum cleaner and perhaps vacuum some of that up. I just don't want sand getting into the between the leaf blades anymore. That was annoying. So we'll just water the perimeter soil and see if that causes lateral root growth and hopefully I'll have a root system that permeates the entire a mass of soil and big root ball so I could get maximal uptake of water and nutrients for this plant. It'll be a lot easier to monitor the wetness of the soil going forward without all that sand in the way. So the next day on day 436 I got some mid-afternoon footage in the full sun the greenness of everything just looks so much more healthy than it did back in the beginning of this episode or the last episode or throughout the end of 2015. So you can see there's a leaf in the middle that's at 40% maximal length maybe and then uh, another one is coming out concurrently in the center so I've never had that before. It's a very promising sign. Hi, it's Melvin Way again. We're back on day 439. I'm going to do some perimeter fertilization. Most of the footage in the first half here will just be watering footage, fertilization footage. This time I'm using some more miracle Grow singles, distilled water, mixing in my watering can. I know it's not going to be completely dissolved uh, efficiently in some cases. Maybe for crystals it'll work better compared to the vitamins. The water just turns uh, light blue and then we're good to go. I'm going to shuffle closer to my Joshua Tree seedling and start watering on the perimeter. So as you can see there's been a little bit of growth. It looks healthy. I'm doing perimeter watering because I don't want too much fertilizer to get right on top of the roots. I want to water on the perimeter so the roots can have some kind of impetus or incentive to grow outwards. Otherwise if I just water on the center each time um, you know, that's going to be where the soil is wettest and the roots have no incentive to grow out. So it's the next day, day 440. I'm doing some vitamin supplementation with my multivitamin pills intended for adult men. So I nearly just threw it in the can there. That would have done nothing if I had just poured water in it. Probably nothing for even days. So I'm going to crush it with a pair of pliers like I did in times past. It's kind of messy like this. Just do it outdoors so you don't make a big mess or don't care if you do. 
And I'm still going to add some Miracle Grow singles in the bottom. Make sure all my plants have enough fertilization. So as you can see in the background, I have my avocado seedling. This is older footage because I haven't done an update on this Joshua Tree seedling for so long. The growth progress is pretty meager compared to, say, an avocado seedling. So there's no point in submitting a new episode every month. So I'm going to do some bottom watering, get the soil wet as far away from the plant's roots as possible to give it that incentive. It's day 443. Just going to do some perimeter watering. Pot was really light prior to all these waterings, but in retrospect, that's a lot of watering for just the span of uh, a few days within a week. But you know, ever since the transplant, this thing has done nothing for a few months and then it started taking off again. Why well, suppose taking off is a very strong phrase because you know this thing is still just kind of sitting there going very very slowly but at least it's not losing leaves anymore. So on day 450 give it more distilled water. Now previously I was watering it like every two or even three weeks or even close to a month and I don't think that was frequent enough. One of my viewers said that he has a Joshua tree or a few seedlings in Texas. So here I'm watering every 10 days for this time period. So anyway, I think in the region where he lives in Texas, it gets uh, maybe 40 something inches of rain a year. So that's a lot. He has outdoor pots and that ensures that his Joshua tree seedlings get rain frequently throughout the year. That's very different from you know the 14 or so inches that Joshua Tree National Park might get. Was it 10? I don't remember the exact figure but you know 12 days later or whatever I'm doing aspirin watering because my avocado seedling ran into some trouble. So based on previous episodes I explained that aspirin can induce uh, systemic acquired resistance. It can help your plants against disease, uh, bugs, or other kinds of infestations or just general stress. So this is a lot easier to dissolve these low-dose aspirin dissolvable tablets. And I have about a liter in each of these 1.5 liter REI uh, canteens. So I'm going to do some watering on the perimeter again on the same principle that you don't want to have all the water just uh, go directly on top in the center although I kinda did a little bit of that here the other reason I kind of avoid the center is because uh, the potting mix and sand what little bit I still have left in there keeps shifting around and gets between the bases of the leaves so it's day 485 uh, there are white burn spots noticed that weren't there before so I'm going to have to conclude that the aspirin watering doesn't really do anything because it didn't really help in the case of my avocado seedling when it got into trouble. And in this case, you can see some leaf damage has occurred, somewhat akin to, say, warts or calluses forming on human skin. And typically after I do aspirin watering or fertilization, I'm afraid of the splash, so I do some of this distilled water spraying. And the other thing is my father tried aspirin watering with some of his plants and didn't really notice any beneficial effects. I know in the beginning I said, you know, it doesn't seem like it hurts, but it could help. And in this case, I'm lifting the pot to gauge the weight of the potting mix, and I'm going to do some further washing like that. Although, like I said, you might get some sand grains stuck between the blades at the bottom. So anyway, yeah, I think that whole aspirin experiment is a big failure. Uh, there's really no benefit to be seen. My father said, you know, some of his plants even got hurt by higher concentrations of aspirin. So different plant species have different tolerances. So now I'm showing footage from Joshua Tree National Park. I went in September of 2016 on a weekend. I got an annual pass. I'll be visiting a lot more national parks. So if you visit more than four times a year, it's worth your money. And I heard in some cases it costs like $30 to get into some of the Utah National Parks. 
haven't verified that myself, but that would definitely make three or four trips worth it. And you can go in and out you know, as many times as you want, whereas a day pass is just $20. So as you can see, the Joshua trees look quite different from what I've been showing you this entire time on my balcony. You have these adventitious shoots, it seems, coming out. And quite frankly, there's very little foliage on these trees. You have these um, just barely serrated on the edges, uh, big fat blades coming out that spike and they're pretty thick in the wild. And it seems like they just die back after a while. That's the fate of all these uh, blades basically, or needles if you want to call them. They just fold in the opposite direction. Uh, according to gravity and form a protective coat for the tree trunks so it seems like in this case Joshua trees can recover even when they fall over for whatever weird reason I don't think these tree trunks are as solid as they are with uh, you know hardwoods or even softwood trees that grow really fast so you can see the needles folding down there uh, here's a case where you're looking over the cliffs and you can only see one Joshua tree there all alone. Uh, one trick a friend showed me is to freeze your sports drinks or water bottles before you leave the house and then let it thaw slowly as you're out during the day. So in this case I froze a bottle of body armor. This is great because it has lots of potassium and other salts that you need. If you sweat a lot on this day I didn't really sweat that much you know I was wearing short sleeve viscose shirt and it wasn't that hot it was maybe about 80 Fahrenheit uh, which is I think 26 Celsius so it's not too bad and you can see after four and a half to five hours it's still all frozen in the core which is excellent in fact it's kinda slow so this is what a dead Joshua tree looks like oh and I might add that if you freeze a drink like that the core is essentially distilled water ice, so it sort of uh, self-distills in a kind of reverse process as normal water distillation. And the first sips of a melted energy drink or whatever sports drink that you drink in will be super sweet because it's ultra concentrated. So you can see the leaf tips here, the blades are blackened whitened at the very extremities. It seems like that's very normal for a Joshua tree. This is what it looks like staring at a big pine branch end or something like that. And who knows how old this thing is because from what I've read most Joshua tree seedlings grow I think three or four inches per year in the beginning. That's 7.5 to 10 centimeters. That's nothing. So this thing, some of these uh, I guess you would call them saplings that we're looking at could be as old as me. So this one has already gotten off to a weird start. It's kind of crawling on the bottom like a snake. And this one has so many adventitious shoots, or at least that's what it looks like. They could all be, you know, sister seeds or whatever that just grew in the same place. But I kind of doubt it because the main trunk suggests there's an extensive root system coming out of it and that would mean that it would suck up all the water nearby and not allow any competition. That's why Joshua trees are always spaced fairly far apart. They don't grow dense like a New England forest or boreal forest, etc. So this Joshua tree is very interesting. It fell over. It's quite old, uh, possibly much older than anyone watching this video. And out of the top of this trunk, it's been in this position for probably a very long time. All these shoots came out, and I bet that's as long as they're going to get. They're not going to form trunks. If they did, the weight would just break everything off. But as you can see, there's just not that much foliage for your average Joshua tree. There's just lots and lots of sun exposure and probably just not enough water to sustain any more foliage or growth than that. So this is my favorite Joshua tree. I call it the telephone pole Joshua tree. It's along one of the main paved roads. There are dirt roads you can go on if you have an off-road vehicle or if you want to go on foot. 
So when I initially made a video about this special tree, I was thinking it's 45 feet tall, but I think 35 to 40 is more accurate. It's not as tall as I once thought. But these ones that are next to it are pretty healthy and big. I'm not sure if there's a correlation between the road helping to collect water underneath it because it prevents evaporation after it rained, but you know, then I thought maybe they just built the roads there uh, next to the biggest Joshua trees just to attract more visitors. So it's day 513. We're back to my balcony. We have lots of healthy growth, but this is a far cry from what we just saw. Even the smallest Joshua tree seedlings where it's just like a head, a tuft of spikes sticking out of the ground look way more developed than this. The blades are much broader, much more robust. So I think despite all the early root rot in which I lost three out of four seedlings and the transplant afterwards, um, you know, we're back on track and we're definitely growing and growing. This looks a lot more developed than even compared to the beginning of this episode, which was um, you know, in the 400 and something days. So yeah, it's been probably less than 80 days and there's been a significant amount of growth and I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and watering on the perimeter and from the bottom and we'll see how far this takes us. So stay tuned for the next episode. Hi, it's Melvin Way. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's day 535. As you can see, there's a little bit of progress. Spraying some distilled water just to wash off the leaves and make them free of dust and the occasional cobwebs that little spiders set up, etc. So yeah, it's basically just no more fertilization, just watering, watering and more watering and waiting. And I'm mostly going to be watering from the bottom watering tray since I don't want to disturb the soil at the top by just pouring in such a heavy flow of water. If I do it from the top, I usually do it in a ring and I spin this uh, Lazy Susan on the bottom. So that's about a liter of distilled water. I'll last it for a while. It's day 567. I'm repeating this again. So it's getting into late fall and the days are getting colder. I've been having to shift this pot further and further to the right on my balcony. But as you can see, it's getting more robust. It's getting bigger. It sort of resembles a, you know, a nascent pineapple plant or whatever. So, yeah, it's just more and more of the same. Just waiting for this thing to get bigger. And, yeah, it's probably going to be like this for a long time. Just many more episodes of me spraying or pouring water or just watering in general from the top or the bottom and until I discern that there's any problem with fertilization I won't be fertilizing I did plenty of that this year in 2016 so I just lifted the pot to gauge the wetness of the soil and it seems pretty light um, if you do that regularly with pots you'll have a very good sense of how much water is in there which is important. I think the days of worrying about this thing dying from overwatering and root rot are long gone. So, you know, one liter of water from a can on the perimeter to promote some extra root growth, maybe every, let's see, week or two, that'll do. I'm not really doing any um, scientific measuring or anything like that. I don't have a soil uh, moisture monitor or anything like that. It's just old school, kind of feel the pot, water is needed, everything looks healthy, just keep doing what you're doing over and over and that's basically it. So this is kind of you know tedious, this method of watering. So I'll be looking to get a new kind of watering pail or can. You know I chose this thing, it's a shiny metal red based on aesthetics and yeah it looks beautiful but you know, it's not all it's cut out to be. There's definitely more optimal stuff out there. So I'll, I'll just look around on Amazon and see if I can get something better in the future. As you can see, just one liter of watering like this will take forever if you don't want to pour violently and, you know, create waves in the soil that will dry out to become like abscesses and, you know, dunes. So it's day 598. 
and I'm doing this watering again. You can see the sun's a lot weaker compared to the last episode after the span of a month. The water is also kind of discolored because I had some water sitting in this can, you know, as a storage vessel. Um, I produced too much water with my water distiller, so I just kind of stored some in this can for, I don't know, maybe a few weeks or maybe just a week. And the water looks a little bit rusty coming out. I hope that's fine. I don't think uh, paint really gets in there, but it's just iron oxide, you know, FEO, chemical symbol. So, yeah, if the plant needs iron, it's going to get plenty of that, but um, I'm hoping it doesn't cause problems. I'll probably have to wash off the leaves of the spray bottle after this just to make sure that rust water doesn't do anything to those lower leaves I'm splashing it on. But yeah, the days are getting shorter, the angle of the sun is changing relative to this position, so, you know, during the day I'm only getting maybe an hour, uh, not even two I bet, sometimes maybe even just like, I don't know, it seems like not even an hour of direct sunlight. So I went back to Joshua Tree National Park in January, this is 2017, and this is a specimen that's uh well every specimen looks different in joshua tree and that's part of the majestic beauty and the fun of it all you know the weirdness of this landscape is it's a high desert in california and as you can see this sort of looks like it's going to be a palm tree but actually this is your typical joshua tree that is as of yet unbranched so the leaf tips are all dead like this and yeah, there's there's a few dead leaves, so if that happens to your homegrown Joshua tree, then that's normal. And that certainly happened to mine. Uh, the bottom leaves just die off and produce like a this palm tree beard effect that you would see with Mexican fan palms. And these leaves are obviously much bigger, but you got to wonder how old this thing is because mine is growing very slowly. And part of that... I think a large part of that is just because my Joshua tree is on a balcony and only gets indirect um, afternoon sun, especially during the winter. You know, even during the summer, it only gets maybe four, five hours of uh, direct sun, maybe six, and that's a real stretch of direct sun. But during the winter, you know, since the tilt of the earth and all affects the angle at which the sunlight strikes, you know, it's a lot weaker and the duration is much, much shorter. And there's that hill right in front of, uh, between the sun and my balcony in the late afternoon. So that prevents an extra maybe hour or two of sunlight from getting there. This is a dead Joshua tree. Um, it looks more conventional in appearance, but I noticed a lot of these things are just hollow inside. So yeah, that stump that I was just showing you is pretty interesting too. And then this is just going to be three minutes of hiking footage, um, very late in the day, you know. In January, you're pretty much going to see sundown by maybe 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. So, you know, with just half an hour or an hour to go, it's like this already. Your shadow is really long and the sun goes down really quickly. It's just really serene and quiet around here in Joshua Tree National Park and every tree is different in appearance virtually except for the very short unbranched ones i mean those yeah they pretty much look the same but they really vary in appearance after that i mean some kind of curve and fall down back to the earth and others branch in just the weirdest ways or just grow on one side and you can see yucca and you know creosote and things like that and some different species of choya cacti so it's really quiet up here. If you just stand still on the trails, you'll hear practically nothing if you're far away enough from the roads, uh, except maybe for the distant rumbling, low-key rumbling of an Air Force base that's nearby. Um, that makes some rumbling. You know, if there's planes taking off, they're, they're testing things. But other than that, you know, during this time of year, I just didn't really hear any animals. Um, hardly any birds chirping during the day and I didn't actually see any I just heard some and when the sun goes down you know I didn't see anything no 
uh, mule deer or mountain lions or rattlesnakes or coyotes or didn't hear owls or anything. So even though this place is really remote and you'd expect animals to come out at night, I just, you know, there's just nothing. To the right, you have a tree that's growing nearly parallel to the ground. So yeah, it's a definitely interesting place. Uh, if you get an eighty dollar annual pass, national parks pass, you know I think they raised the price. Coming in here, it's like twenty five dollars a pop for a car. So, you know if you come here three times in a year, which I think I've already done, you're pretty much paying. It's paying for itself. Plus, you can go to all the other national parks too, which I do plan to go to some other ones as well. So this is a a very interesting place and. You know, if you go on a weekday, there's practically no one. Uh, weekends are a lot more crowded and touristy. But I, I think a lot of tourists don't go on these trails because they already spent a few hours driving here, and they probably don't plan on spending the entire day in Joshua Tree National Park. Or if they do, you know, they're with kids and whatnot, and they just don't want to spend, like, a four-hour block walking on a multi-mile-long trail and sweating in the summer heat. All right, it's day 641 for my Joshua Tree series. It's been a really long time, and here's my new watering can. It's plastic, so it won't rust. You can turn this thing around. You can even see the water level inside it. And you can detach this very easily if you want to. It's made by OXO. It's pretty good. It holds three liters. So that eliminates the whole problem with the water disturbing the soil at the top making pits after it dries out and whatnot and give this whole plant a good wash and kind of rotate around to give you a good vantage point from different angles what this plant is like right now so it's a lot bigger than it was before but it's not huge or anything not even like the totem pole looking ones in Joshua Tree National Park. So yeah, the water stream is very gentle and uh, this has a lot more capacity than my old metal watering can. So that's good. So I think that's enough for now. Welcome back. It's day 684. It's growing. Everything's fine by Joshua Tree standards. As is often mentioned in the literature, these things grow at 3 inches a year. That's 7.5, 7.6 centimeters. That's an average, of course, but I assume they take these statistics from a vast number of Joshua trees in the Mojave Desert, um, high deserts of California. So it's day 712. You know, there's no point in staring at the same thing that you've seen all this time for very long per day. So I cut out the watering footage. Uh, it seems to be developing something that barely resembles a trunk, sort of like a, you know, base of a palm tree or some kind of uh, plant like that. So on day 768, I'm watering yet again. Um, I don't need to water that often. It's not like the passion fruit vine or the sweet nanny where you know it needs water almost every day or every other day at the the very least. Um, this you can just water and if the watering tray fills up in this pot and you know it reaches capacity, I can just let it sit there for a week, maybe even two weeks. It doesn't have much evaporation. It's a very high desert dry climate adapted plant. You can see it's grown uh, a significant amount by Joshua Tree standards, although it's still far away from having a trunk. The blades are getting longer. I poke myself on these things all the time because the passion fruit vines constantly trying to body splash this thing and send their tendrils around to coil that thing. And when I'm filming, you know, I, I poke myself too. So there's nothing in that watering tray that I can see. It's not like the other plants, uh, you know, annuals and the perennials that just have uh, roots directly down there drinking water, although I thought the Joshua tree would be prone to do that. It's often mentioned that 
Joshua trees have delicate roots that are shallow, so you can't go to Joshua Tree National Park and hang a hammock on them and lie on the ones that are tilted over and growing on the ground, you know, sideways or upside down. Uh, people do that a lot. Uh, there are people that try to go on social media and, you know, educate these people, but, you know, there's always going to be new visitors doing the same thing. So I have uh, patches of miracle Grow I scooped out of a container. This is the vegetative growth kind, and uh, it's been noted before that fertilizer is perhaps more important than an abundance of water, but I'm sure, you know, having a lot of water can't hurt. This has been my longest standing plant growing series, and I intend to keep it that way. If there was just one plant I could keep out of the bunch, it would be my Joshua tree here. All right, it's day 817 of my Joshua Tree series. It's been half a month since the last update, so there's been some change, although to my eye it's not very noticeable because I look at this almost every day. So the trunk is coming along nicely. The leaves at the bottom keep dying. That's just what they do with Joshua Trees. Although I'll be showing you an example in a few minutes of a Joshua Tree that's very peculiar looking aren't they all, that seemingly has foliage that extends for a very um, large distance on the trunk that hasn't died. And I recall seeing many Joshua trees where the ends of the branches just have a tuft of um, sword-like leaves like this and that's it. So I'm getting rid of the vine offshoots. I have to beat them off with a stick every day. And I'm going to fertilize a little bit more with this miracle grow. It's getting all the water it needs, but you know who knows how much nutrition it needs. Hopefully, I don't over fertilize. You know, with all of my plant series in 2017, I haven't over fertilized, in my opinion, for any of them. Uh, even the California goldenrod has recovered by now, despite its uh, malaise from overwatering. The roots and the watering tray died. I can give an update on that in maybe a few days or a week or so when it's uh, grown yet even taller. So it's reached new heights. And for this, it, I just fertilize on the perimeter so I don't cause any over fertilization or burns of any sort. You can see the phototropism displayed by this plant. I thought that wouldn't be an issue, but even with the Joshua tree, it's bending towards the light. California goldenrod has phototropism pretty badly too. So I used to have this on a spinning platform. Um, I could just spin the pot around, but then I wouldn't have access to the watering tray um, just visually, so I wouldn't be able to tell how much I've watered or lack thereof. Um, the watering tray runs dry mostly for this. I don't want to repeat the mistake of early on in the series where you know there was root rot. But other than early on in the series, this thing has made a miraculous recovery. Looks very healthy as others have commented. So we're going back to the wild, to my last Joshua Tree National Park visit. This is the one I referred to where foliage seemingly takes forever and ever to die on this trunk. I don't know if I've showed this one before. I don't think so. Um, after you've seen all these different Joshua trees, it's kind of hard to recall how many you've shown to your viewers. Um, I've filmed a lot of Joshua trees because they're all so bizarre looking. This one is just a giant spike club, uh, you know, roto rooter or whatever. And the leaves seem to go in different directions. Um, you have some going side parallel to the ground, some going up, some going down. So it creates a very unique look. And those are all the dead leaves on the trunk. This here is the bladder sage or paperback bush. It's a shrub of the mint family, distinctive for its calyx lobes that develop into small bag or bladder-like shells around the fruits. I like them when they have this purplish tinge to them rather than just everything being a bunch of white bladders. You know, it adds a lot of color, makes it more vivid. And here's another Joshua tree with three adventitious shoots. Makes you wonder how old the adventitious shoots are because if you take the average growth rate in the literature of three inches per year, then they must be, 
you know, 20 or 30 years old. And I don't know how much of that is true. If you're comparing that to seedlings, maybe these adventitious shoots get all their nutrition from the parent tree, so they'll grow a lot faster. Because uh, in my mind, this three inches per year thing just doesn't add up. I mean, should be more opportunity for growth um, during winter when they re receive rain. So uh, I'm not sure, especially with a plant that has so little foliage and, you know, I'm sure it has the waxy cuticle and it has the sword-like leaves that are excellent at conserving moisture and, you know, trapping air uh, in between the pockets of uh, all those sword-like leaves, you know, that prevents, uh, that breaks up the wind and prevents evaporation further. So I'm not sure, you know, why these things grow so slowly, but it's just a very interesting, exotic looking desert plant. And you can see the bearded uh, branches where all the leaves died. And after a very, very long time, who knows how long, they give way to just bare bark-like appearance. So here's a shrub that I'm not quite sure, you know, what it is. If you know, uh, please respond in the comments. I know I have a lot of uh, botanists and uh, plant experts, local flora and fauna experts around. But the main focus of this is actually the desert Christmas tree, which I saw a lot of. The desert Christmas tree is a very interesting parasitic plant that lives off the root system of its host plant, which I just showed you earlier. And it saps its water and nutrients, so it doesn't need to do any of that on its own. It's kind of like the mushrooms of the fungi kingdom. You'll never see the actual organism except for the reproductive structures. In this case, you have these woody inflorescences that pop up in clusters like this. And do have the general morphology of small mushrooms to some extent. So if you catch these at the exact right moment, they'll be covered in beautiful uh, violet colored flowers. And I did get some pictures of nearly perfect specimens at the right time, but I don't have any video footage. Uh, a lot of this was in the shade, you know, it was in the afternoon. And this is Desert Daughter, D-O-D-D-E-R. It's the analog of Chaparral Daughter, which is the stuff around me in the Chaparral at much lower elevation, much closer to the Pacific Ocean. It looks exactly the same in it operates the same. Looks like a bunch of uh, dried out instant noodles. You know, it's got these modified root structures called Hostoria that burrow into the host plant and extract its water nutrients. It doesn't need to photosynthesize. So this is an organism, a parasitic plant in which everything you see is above ground. It's the opposite of the desert Christmas tree. So I'm not quite sure why this hasn't just taken over the entire landscape. In some areas, it does have a very a considerable domination over the local flora, but it's never like a complete blowout. So this is kind of what my channel used to be, you know, just a lot of documentary style, um, later on narrated videos about local flora and fauna, but there just wasn't that much of a market for it. I think most people don't know about these plants and animals so they don't look them up and hence uh, I wasn't getting much traffic and I didn't know where else to put this stuff except in my Joshua Tree video. Welcome back it's day 834 of this Growing Joshua Trees from Seed Series. You can see all the items for fertilization that I've distributed beforehand for several plants. In this pot I have one Tums, two men's multivitamins that I eat and a scoop, or maybe two, I forgot, of miracle Grow fertilizer. And this initial watering won't be too heavy. I just want to dissolve all the miracle Grow. I decided it's a bit more work in all these individual cases to crush all these vitamin pills and whatnot with pliers. So I'll just wait for it. It's already getting soggy, as you can see. It has a dissolvable coat. It'll get sloppier as the minutes go by. 
and I'm not in a rush to distribute those contents into the soil so it can just go into there over several consecutive waterings in the future so it's a cloudy day the footage isn't as nice when it's overcast but I think for this instance the Sun peaked out between the clouds for a brief moment where the clouds thinned you can see the trunk of the Joshua tree getting taller and fuller the bottom leaves die that's natural and normal in every single case I've seen in the wild leaves just continuously die and I keep bumping into the dead spikes at the ends of these green swords so in some cases I have to straighten them out and I see that I've caused a tiny bit of damage fresh green fibers within are connected to those dead ends I could also snip them off that's something I could do it wouldn't make much of a difference so I've had this on the ground for a few days while I recoded my wooden table having the plant down here is definitely a bad thing as it further reduces the amount of sunlight it receives especially with a passion fruit vine trying to hog up all of the sunlight for itself but other than sunlight the only factor I can really control right now to optimize is by adding more fertilizer hello and welcome back to my youtube channel it's day 862 this series has gone on for a very long time it's almost approaching three years Josh keeps growing taller with more leaves I've removed some of the compost debris after the cantaloupe seedling series which lasted for only three weeks I uprooted all the cantaloupe seedlings and scattered some of them on the surface on one side of this pot and they started to look gross it doesn't decompose fully right away so it just looks like a bunch of uh, vegetable debris garbage on the surface I didn't like that so I just removed all of that as well as a few dead leaves I'll be doing some cleanup work in this video update and I'll do some watering at the end I don't think any additional fertilization and watering is really helping at this point the main limiting factor is the fact that it doesn't get full Sun like its Joshua tree cousins would get out in the Mojave Desert in the high desert with Sun for all those hours a day and they tend to grow on flat ground so they receive as much Sun as possible unlike plants that would be growing on hillsides north facing slopes etc or valleys gullies these plants like as much Sun as they can get and I can't provide that so I'm declawing Josh right now like I'd be clipping the nails on a cat I've been poked so many times by this plant that it's been getting really annoying and I'm sick of it I've been stabbed at least 20 times maybe a lot more maybe it's 30 or 40 or 50 times now most of those are just minor pricks where there's some pain and it reminds me to quickly withdraw but on other occasions I've been doing camera work or working on other plants nearby and you know, one time I was wearing gloves and I heard a loud pop as I accidentally palmed one of these uh, blades and actually the least damaged thing was my skin in my hand it was mostly well the glove burst in that point obviously and I broke off one of these hardened tips so those close-ups you got of the hardened tips in this video in the beginning and in many other previous episodes that's just how Joshua tree leaves end up the tip always dies I think that's by design so it's sort of a, a fire hardened spear tip so to speak it's just dead tissue that provides for protection against large mammal predators potentially although in the wild I've never seen anything feed on these I don't think there are any reports of deer or any other large animals having the gall to try to feed on these things they basically have no predators I don't see any insect predators on them so they're just happy to grow at this glacial pace forever and ever and as I tugged on that I initially tried to rip off these dead leaves at the base and it exerted a bit of a pull a bit of a tug on the main trunk so I stopped and now I'm using these clippers I'm just throwing the tips onto the dirt hope that doesn't come back to bite me later but I'm making things more aesthetic I've cleaned up most of the uh, garbage so to speak on the surface of the soil the decomposing cantaloupe seedlings 
and there's still plenty of debris left but as long as it looks mostly organic and natural I'm happy to just leave all that stuff there and it has moss and other things like algae growing so it looks uh, aesthetic enough and with all this clipping I'll no longer have all of the stab problems I mean they don't really generate wounds sometimes it will draw a tiny little bit of blood and then I just go inside and put on some antibiotic cream uh, ointment you know with uh, it's got painkiller in it so it basically stops the pain more than anything but in the literature you'll read that being punctured by Joshua trees and other plants uh, cacti especially choya cacti can lead to deadly infections so you definitely want to avoid that but Josh here has been growing on a very sterile third floor balcony environment in the coastal lowlands for almost three years and I haven't gotten seemingly any infection or uh, nothing was ever really a risk in my opinion or, or danger to me but it'll be nice to do this for the first time and it doesn't really affect the aesthetics it does if you look very close up but in terms of saving me from being stabbed a million more times uh, I'm very happy to make this do this preventative maintenance work and for some of those new blades coming out I won't need to touch them for a long time seems like the blades have gotten much longer the plant looks a little more spindly because of it and because there's no full sun I think the blades just aren't as broad and as thick as they would be as I see in the wild but most of those young wild Joshua trees are actually adventitious shoots that come out of the ground from a mother tree a parent tree so I think my job is done here I've clipped almost all these leaves and back to what I was saying earlier those adventitious shoots they get all the nutrition from the parent tree hence they can be so thick and robust looking coming straight out of the ground just watering with some distilled water to rinse off the leaves and eventually I will fertilize but since this is a very slow growing plant I think fertilizing too much would be detrimental basically just guesstimate based on how much new biomass and leaf surface area this plant has. It's nothing compared to the passion fruit vine. Alright, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is day 877 of my Joshua Tree growing series, my longest standing plant growing series. And I have a green plant hopper hiding amidst the foliage. At first I was thinking why did a piece of Joshua Tree leaf, these very tough sword-like blades, just break off and fall in there and you can see some of those other uh, sow thistle seeds in there that blew around. So it's day 881. And again, this green plant hopper won't leave. I've moved this pot up, as I'll show you later. I rearranged everything. I wanted to get this plant off the balcony floor because it doesn't get that much sunlight, especially with everything on this table, which I didn't always have before, and the passion fruit vine. All the sunlight just gets soaked up before it really hits the floor of the balcony. So I don't want this to continue to get only one to two hours of afternoon, mid-afternoon sunlight a day. That's not nearly enough for something that's accustomed to full sun in the high desert. It grows in the valleys. So at 4,000 plus feet elevation, it's just growing on flat ground. It gets a lot of hours of sunlight a day. So this is my setup. I refinished my table and unfortunately that beautiful red finish the wood stain just uh, rubs off from all the activity I do all the wiping and the water that keeps landing on there it's very corrosive to whatever I put on top so that plant hopper is still there it's a minor nuisance but I'm wondering if pests such as these are responsible for what I'll show you later which are these warty little growths that are becoming ever so common so on day 883, um, this is the state of my Joshua tree. At this point, I was still fertilizing with a squirt bottle. I was no longer scooping just heaps and heaps of blue crystalline miracle grow all over the soil surface and crushing vitamins and whatnot. I went easy on this for a while because I figured nutrition wasn't really the limiting factor here. So this blade has a rip there, a tear. I don't know how that happened. Maybe it was just some damage that I caused very early on by snagging onto it with my clothes or 
my uh, fingers or forearms or whatnot. And sometimes uh, these plants can draw a little blood, but I've declawed this cat, as you saw in a previous episode. I took a pair of trimmers and clipped off all the spiky ends. So that's no longer a problem because this plant was really causing me a lot of problems. Causing me a lot of pain, really. So I don't fertilize all that much these days, uh, not with the Joshua tree at least. I just want to give it full sun and hope all these uh, warty growths on the bottom bleeds uh, just go away after a while. Or, well, they won't go away. It's just I don't want that to happen to all the new leaves. I'll give you a closer up look later on. But so far, everything's looking good. I don't know if this would continue to look good if I had it on the balcony floor. Probably not. It wasn't getting nearly enough sunlight. And even now, I would say, you know, maybe it's not getting enough sunlight. So if you look at those uh, blades in the middle that are coming out, they're pretty short. You know, they're slightly above half length. So as you can see here, I've watered. And at the very bottom, it looks like it's more narrow, the funnel. And those leaves have long died. Those are where I trimmed back or just pulled them off after they died, the, the blades. So there are a lot of low-lying blades that are dying. That's a continuous phenomenon you'll see with Joshua trees in the wild. They just keep losing leaves and losing leaves. So it's day 925. And I decided, along with many other plants, that I'm going to add some real Southern California dirt to the top. So a lot of crops are grown in Southern California, well, California in general, and the soil is fairly rich. There aren't any orchards like right nearby, but, you know, within a 10 or 20 mile radius, plenty. So this is on 5X fast forward. Don't want to bore you, but these uh, chunks of very fine dirt are sometimes reminiscent of pebbles. That's why I'm doing all this a feeling between my fingertips to kind of break up these clumps of dirt and there are also a lot of small pebbles in there which I throw out I don't like that and that would just get in the way and inhibit plant growth so it's a fair bit of just fine sifting manually I do have a sieve on my balcony floor I haven't used it for this that would stir up a lot of dust and I'd recommend if you're working with this kind of very dry soil which I got a bag of you know Maybe it's just five pounds or so from the outside. Uh, I dug it out with a trowel. It's uh, very heavy. It's very dense. I'm sure it's very nutrient rich and it's got seeds of all sorts of things. But as you can see, just by watering here, there's all this dust being kicked up. So I'd recommend wearing safety glasses that wrap around just so you don't get that in your eyes, especially if you have contact lenses or whatnot. You don't want that to uh, dirtier lenses so just uh, go ahead and shower off the edges of this pot which is something I'll have to do later it seems like there's a little bit of splash but that's okay it doesn't seem to get anywhere else it's uh, remarkably self-contained after you water everything sort of congeals it's very fine dirt and I have seen some comments before on my previous Joshua Tree videos to the effect of you should be planting this in sand. Well, those people just don't understand that this doesn't grow in sand. Nothing grows in pure sand. Not here, not in the high desert or interior deserts, not in Arizona or the Sahara Desert. Basically, it grows in a fine desert soil like this or something very similar to this. It's actually very rich of these semi-desert or semi-arid soils. So as you can see, the drainage is very slow for such a thin layer and even on 5x fast forward it's barely going in there so it forms a great seal I've already done this with my other plants well my passion fruit plant has a full seal this one does too I didn't dig up enough dirt to provide a full seal for some of my other plants but that's okay if we're just dealing with seedlings I only need to have the a seal or real dirt be around the base of the stem for nascent plants and you can see some of my other pots. I have a lemon seedling, a pineapple tops, and whatnot. So it's day 933. I gave Josh a haircut. So it's lost a little bit of mass, this Joshua tree. But as you can see, the older blades were very unsightly. They had all these warty growths. 
So I decided to trim the very low-lying ones, regardless of whether the plant's doing well. It's going to lose those low-lying blades, and they'll keep folding back and forming a, a dead beard of foliage, as they do in the wild. So most of the time, it takes a really long time for the trunk to get exposed. So there hasn't been that much growth in the center. Well, the blades are nearly full length, so there's that, but the, the number of leaves coming out from that funnel in the center is not impressive lately. I think that's because of the maybe month or six week or two week, uh, two month period where this was on the balcony floor. I didn't have enough space. I wasn't staggering these pots on the balcony floor. So as you can see there, tons of warty growths. I don't like that. It looks a lot better like this and it's trimmed back so it looks like it has more of a trunk but honestly there hasn't been that much development since the last episode but i think by placing this close to the balcony rail on top of the table it has a much better position to receive much more sun every day so instead of say one one and a half hours it can get at least four or five i think so as you can see here, this wild dirt, it forms a very good seal. It's very easy to gauge the hydration of the pot and moss is growing. At least I think that's moss, if not some kind of algae. Uh, blades of wild grass are growing in some of my pots as well. So I wouldn't be surprised to get mushrooms and some other things growing in there. As long as they're not giant weeds like the so thistle of my century plant, I don't really care. I could always pull stuff when it gets too big and it starts being a drain on the resources of the pot. And hopefully I'll just do that um, when they're very small. So I don't want anything to get like the so thistle of my century pot plant um, from that series that I just ended where it just grows to a huge size within a month or two. So as you can see here, the drainage is very slow and that's great it has a beautiful reflection that means it's trapping all the hydration underneath the potting mix is very hygroscopic so it also means that fungus gnats will have a hard time burrowing in and out I'm sure the ants won't have a problem though it's very interesting to have this reflection I think it gives my pots a much better aesthetic and I hope the microbes from the wild and the fungi and whatnot will seed the potting mix underneath which was once sterilized but this has gone on for a really long time so if anything i'm sure the pot the potting mix inside it was all full of microbes anyway uh, probably more moles and mosses than anything else probably not a lot of bacteria i'm going to go out in the wild and get more bags of dirt and hopefully that will trigger a renaissance in my plant growing and much better progress in the future Thanks for watching and please stay tuned. All right, it's been a long time since I've had an update for Josh over here. It's day 1009. Josh receives about only two hours of mid-afternoon sunlight per day. It's January 2018. And past about 3 p.m., 3.30, I think, the sun goes over that hill that you may have seen at the beginning of many of my plant clips and videos. So by 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, sun's over the hill and gone and the sun doesn't really hit this balcony until maybe 1.30 at the best uh, maybe 1 p.m. so that's about two hours so as you can see there are less warty growths on the newer leaves the blades and these bottom ones still look pretty nasty and warty uh, all these warts came about well, they were always there to some extent, but there were a lot more of them. And I trimmed some of those uh, older blades away that were really crusty and ugly looking when Josh was on the balcony floor. When I had some of my succulents, such as the century plant, down there. But now that he's up here, it's a little uh, better. I think the amount of sunlight received is definitely very important. And we've got a lot of terrestrial algae or moss growing on there. Of course, I don't even know if Josh is female or male. I'm just uh, giving it a name, and Josh seemed like the most logical name to give it. So the blades look healthier. There are more of them coming out from that funnel in the center. And the wild dirt that I sifted on there seems to be doing its job. 
holding everything in place. So this is a weather report from February 2018, the 4th. And as you can see, this is very, very atypical for Southern California even. It's just been a very dry winter. I remember having two days of rain and that's it. So on day 1017, I uh, did a little mirror check to see if the watering tray was dry. So I've actually been more generous with the watering for Josh. I've done lots of thorough waterings, deep waterings, until some water would start to drip down into the watering tray and then I'd stop. And it's been a very good formula. So the sunlight and the wetness of this uh, wild dirt on top have made it quite green. It's uh, aesthetically pleasing aside from uh, a few dead blades of grass and the trunk looks a little bit more aesthetic as well because I did some pruning previously long before this episode and eventually as these uh, bottom leaves get older and start to fall down and uh, lose their color I'm gonna trim those too so it'll have the look of some garden variety cycad or some other thing like a palm that's uh, neatly manicured and taken care of. Um, so for these blades in the middle I haven't clipped away the spikes on the end. You know, for the older ones that fan out I did because I kept getting poked. Sometimes they would draw blood and cause a lot of pain. But I think things are looking up. There's uh, more sunlight. The days are getting longer again and I really look forward to that. So. I think in another two or three months, Josh here will be receiving maybe four or five hours of sunlight and eventually around the summer solstice, maybe uh, seven, eight, you know, these things are supposed to receive maybe, I was thinking maybe 14 hours uh, of sun out there in Joshua Tree National Park and I just can't provide for a plant like this, but it's been pretty resilient. This is very drought resistant plant so during those times when it's been very hot during the summers uh, Josh has survived very very well. So it's day 1020 I can't believe it's been almost three years. It's almost uh, third year anniversary for Josh and I've decided to do a deep watering. I'm gonna do this twice a month I think during the winter, although when it gets really, really hot, gets into the 90s and hundreds in maybe August and so on, or just maybe during the summer months, I'll start to water more frequently. And if you do deep waterings, which are said to be much better than uh, frequent shallow waterings, if you do them infrequently, I was thinking maybe once every two weeks is a good frequency. Just divide up the month and do one at the beginning, do one in the middle of the month, and that's it. February is a shorter month. Other than that, there's not much difference. Maybe anytime it gets over 90 Fahrenheit for a prolonged period of time, I'll just uh, do it once a week maybe. It depends on the soil. If I see water collecting in the watering tray, then I'll stop. But I've had long periods of time in the past where the watering tray of Josh has been flooded and I just let him slowly drink away for weeks before all the water was exhausted until it was time to water again or sometimes I would let the dirt dry out. I think Josh has a large tolerance for both drought and overwatering at this point. The root system is fairly developed. It's not a root ball and I don't dare to just pull on the base of the trunk upwards to see if everything will come out of the pot because I think there's a certain amount of fragility um, with Joshua trees. So it's been unseasonably warm. This is a weather report from 2018, February the 4th. And it's been sunny every day, which has been great for Josh. I need a lot more sunlight than I'm able to provide. And this is in Celsius for those of you who don't live in the US. So it's been very uncharacteristic of even Southern California for it to be this sunny and warm. Uh, the warmth and the sunniness definitely help. Um, normally there's a marine layer, lots of clouds and overcast days and plants only receive one-tenth of the light they do 
of a sunny day like this. It's day 1033. And if you compare this footage to the beginning of the video, I think you'll notice there's been a bit of growth, although it's not a lot like it would be with other plants over a 100 day period. So the soil is like that because I rake through it with gloved fingers. I wanted to break up the congealed layer at the top, which was sifted wild dirt from the California chaparral, the hills over potting mix and it just congealed into this solid impermeable layer almost that takes uh, a long time for water to pass through when I water so you can see the new blades in the middle they haven't been trimmed I didn't declaw them but they're significantly longer than they were in weeks past or compared to the previous episode so as long as there's continual growth of new blades from the middle then I'm happy I'm going to do some watering again and I noticed in hindsight that this uh, raking of the top layer of soil didn't really do that much to make it more permeable. What I noticed and in my other pots as well I did this was that the potting mix seems to have decomposed uh, quite quickly in the months following me sifting some wild dirt on top because I think a lot of uh, microbes were brought in, uh, little decomposers like moss and algae and whatnot, and maybe many others that we don't know of, but it's also put a complete stop to the fungus gnat problem I once had in all of my pots filled with potting mix. And I think part of that was because there was a congealed layer at the top, so I always thought I was overwatering, and many of you did as well, but actually this water takes a long time to pass through, so um, what happened was that the potting mix underneath was actually very dry. Many of the pots were very light when I tried lifting them up almost to the point of being bone dry. So in the case of my mango seedling, as I'll publish an episode maybe in a few weeks, it was actually dying of thirst. It wasn't dying from overwatering. So it was quite the shocking discovery. But I think in the case of the Joshua tree, it's very drought resistant very heat resistant and at this point it's got a developed root system so it doesn't fear root rot anymore so this plant could basically take anything that um, I could throw at it in terms of different conditions even if there are suboptimal conditions whereas the non succulent plants couldn't handle that and some of them died or were on the verge of dying so I think the growth has been slow and steady and there's not much I can do um, I do plan on moving in a few months, so hopefully I'll get a place that has a lot more open sun if I can get a balcony or yard or something that can provide this with uh, 12 to 14 hours of sun a day. That would be amazing, and I think the growth would be a lot faster. Hello, and welcome to my YouTube channel. This is an episode of Growing Joshua Trees from Seeds, days 1034 through 1078. I titled it as an episode on how to get rid of scaled insects from Joshua trees because I wanted to attract some new viewers. So that's what this episode is about. Scaled insects are these horrid little warty-like growths that are all over my Joshua tree. I didn't know what they were for the longest time. I thought they were just some kind of warts akin to warts and moles that humans get on their skin. So I didn't bother with these for a very, very long time until as you can see the situation became dire. In some cases scale insects don't kill the host plant but I'm not going to take that risk. Their numbers have exploded over time and I'm not even sure that these are live ones. I've sprayed triazicide, uh, kind of pyrethrin analog insecticide that's pretty mild and has a very short half-life. In the past uh, multiple times on my plants uh, this included but obviously I don't think that's been working. So the first thing I'm going to do is use a floss stick. These are very cheap and typically you use them to floss your teeth although I don't want you to think about that right now. So you're going to scrape up and down like this and it's really really disgusting because they flake off all over the place. Some of these may have been dead for a very long time. Scale insects are these parasites bugs that 
stick their mouth parts into there and feed off the same spot generally forever for the whole life cycle so as you can see it's getting everywhere it's getting on the table that floss is a sickly yellow looking it's getting all over the dirt all over the phone that I'm using to film it's getting on my clothes and whatnot it's just really really disgusting so one idea I had was to potentially just have a running vacuum cleaner nozzle tube right next to this when I'm doing the scraping so I just wanted to give this a try I had never done it before because before I didn't even know what the problem was I just thought the leaves were dying of old age which they do in Joshua Tree so in day 1059 um, the previous night I tried some insecticidal soap so there are warnings in the literature not to use this on certain plants I didn't know how the Joshua Tree would react but they say to spray it on when it's um, cold or overcast or at night because you don't want it to dry out immediately. Insecticidal soap has to be wet for it to work. So you could make your own soap sprays, but if you made one out of hand soap, it would be probably considerably more dangerous. So nothing happened to my Joshua tree. I let it sit on there last night for 30 minutes, then I sprayed a lot of distilled water to wash it off just to be safe because if an insect hasn't died in 30 minutes after being drowned in soap um, then it never will so at that point it doesn't make a difference so I'm cutting off some of these blades here they do get old naturally you can see one on the left that's had a chunk missing um, that was described many 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 episodes ago in this series so I thought, well, why not just put this organic matter to use? It's got all the nutrients that this needs. Maybe if I burn these things with a cigarette lighter, um, I could just scatter the ash on top. I know that's a little alkaline, but it turns out these things don't burn well. And it stinks like crazy. It stinks like a bad wildfire. So I just threw them away. So on day 1071, I tried using packaging tape to remove the scale insects. I didn't like the scraping and the fact that they would fly and get all over the place because they're sort of waxy. So these are armored scale insects. Um, there are armored and soft scaled insects. As far as I know, I don't know a whole lot about scaled in scale insects, but the armored ones, they crawl as nymphs to a new spot. They sink their mouth parts in much like a mosquito or some other kind of parasite and they start drinking and drinking like ticks and then the difference is they never let go they secrete um, these coverings that basically harden and serve as armored shells to protect them from potential predators and that's what you see me sticking all over these tapes largely it's pretty disgusting I mean it's mostly beige, uh, yellow, and white, and I have no idea what's in there. It kind of reminds me of those white things, uh, maybe some kind of sap or pollen secreted by plants in the American Southwest. It often falls onto your car windshield and other windows, or just the body paint, and then it uh, requires physical removal. So that's basically what I'm doing here. Packaging tape has so many uses. It's good for just sticking things. Um, if you have any kind of bug that you want to remove, a piece of packaging tape is perfect. You can just stick the bug and wrap the tape up and throw it away. So you're basically done. So day 1076, I went out and got some more wild dirt. I think it's a nice brown clay loam. So there's sand, which has particles that are pretty big. And then there's silt, and then there's clay and this might be a mixture. So the existing potting mix is what I started with. I've worked with potting mix from miracle Grow for about five years but I've decided that I want to go in a different direction and use real dirt. As many people say a rich organic rotting matter attracts a lot of bugs so I'm just going to layer on some clay loam and everything will sink in when I water and the whole purpose of this is the potting mix is continuously losing volume over time. If you compare it to many videos ago, I'm sure you'll notice that the soil level, uh, dirt level, so to speak, was a lot higher. 
So that's mostly potting mix. I do have some, maybe some trace quantities of sand, you know, other organic matter and diatomaceous earth in there. And I layered on some wild dirt from the same spot that I got out in the wild uh, sometime last year, maybe six months ago in 2017. So it's a nice brown clay loam. That means it's a mixture that may be mostly clay or maybe a third, I don't know. Um, I'd have to do lab tests or whatever to find out the exact composition. But this is largely rock powder. It's inorganic permanent material with a very tiny percentage of organic material mixed in. And I'll throw on some weeds to compost on the top. I think composting on the top is fine in a layer. You just don't want to have a ton of wet rotting stuff underneath generating toxic sewer gases and killing the roots and I think uh, a clay loam will also adhere to the roots better to form stronger connections, uh, more direct connections for nutrient and water uptake. Uh, potting mix has a pretty bad record as you can see from many of my growing series. Um, it just has all sorts of drawbacks but it's light though, so compared to real dirt, if this whole pot were filled with real dirt, it'd be about 50 pounds, I imagine. So potting mix is very light. I think that's why they use it and sell it. I'm scattering the remnants of a weed I dug up while I was getting this real dirt to compost on the top. So the theory is when I shower from the top with my distilled water later, the nutrients from the decomposition will slowly leach into the soil. Of course, this could also grow on its own or try to resurrect, but that's extremely unlikely in the, these positions. So as you can see, there's still a lot of scale insects around. They're on the tops of some of these leaves. Uh, generally, the older leaves are infested, and the newer ones remain pristine for a very long time because these things don't move around. They just migrate when they're nymphs. So for these armored scaled insects, the females which can lay eggs and reproduce without even mating um, they lay a bunch of eggs underneath their armor shell that's secreted and the nymphs crawl out to colonize the plant so as with spider mites it's a very vile pest if I had recognized these for being what they were parasites instead of warty growths I would have taken care of the matter maybe a year or two ago so the theory is every time I water from the top over time after these uh, weed leaves have decomposed or whatever organic detritus I throw on top the nutrients will leak back into the soil and the soil will remain very very low in organic content although as of now the potting mix underneath is still a huge mass I imagine most of the roots are in there so it'll take a very long time of repeating this process to replace all of the potting mix, which will eventually rot away to nothing over many years, I imagine, depending on how wet it stays. Uh, if it stays wet continuously, then it'll decompose a lot faster than if you water very, very sparingly and it just keeps drying out, then it won't rot. So I am watering from the top and that real dirt, the clay loam, will seep in over time so it'll have the appearance of losing volume. So it's day 1078. I'm doing the final touch-up work to remove all scale insect stragglers, dead or alive. And one fun fact I read is the males of scale insects appear to be gnat-like insects, entirely different than these uh, crawling armor-shelled pests that are the females. And I imagine the nymphs, I'm not sure. But yeah, some of these fungus gnats that I've been seeing, they get into my apartment sometimes. Maybe they could have actually been male scale insects just looking to spread out and colonize other plants. So you learn a lot when you observe your plants closely. And I'm using a lot of tape here. Well, maybe not a lot. I mean, this roll lasts forever, even though it's a small roll. But there are limitations to what you can do with this sticky packaging tape. It's really hard to get the tips there. You saw, saw me just try 
you have to use your fingernail to kind of guide the tape in and press it in. Um, it's pretty hard to damage a Joshua tree like this. But it's also hard to get out all of the remaining scale insect bodies. I'm not sure if the pyrethrin analog triazocide, which is several years old, maybe it's even expired, if that did anything to these scale insects, but I'm thinking that insecticidal soap had to have killed them, or hopefully most of them. But you can never be too sure, so for aesthetic reasons, also I want to remove all of the remaining pests or their bodies or armor shells. Not too sure how many of these are alive. Um, it's just a little mess, their armored shell, and it's a white or yellow secretion or some a variation in between. And it just looks like, uh, maybe it look like boogers or earwax or whatever. It's just the most disgusting thing that I've ever encountered, aside from maybe spider mites. Those were pretty horrible as well. So it takes a lot of using the pointy serrated end of a floss stick to pick out all the ones that are at the bases of these leaves. And again, I'm not sure if everything's dead. I would have hoped so from the insecticidal soap treatment. But just to be sure, I want to knock everything loose. And I'm pretty sure once you scrape these little bugs off or their armor shells, then they're vulnerable to drying out. And then, plus you're knocking them onto the surface of the dirt. And bear in mind, these things don't really ever move. I've never seen them move. That's why I had trouble figuring out that these were insects instead of warts of some analog or something like that. So this is on fast forward. I'm getting rid of lots of these things. And then I'm going to scrape the insides of the tips of the leaves. That's typically where the infestations are worse. So by covering the surface area of the leaves, they deny the plant the light needed for photosynthesis. And by sucking out the juices, they directly feed off the plant and deny the entire plant resources and may even cause infections, cause the plant to uh, just cut its losses and just kill off the leaves to shut off their food source and shed them. So as you can see, there's all this crap. Um, dead scale insects flying out or their armored shells at least if they're long gone and it's a very painstaking process so I had to do this for all these leaves there's still 40 or more left I imagine and it's just a constant process of looking in every nook and cranny of which there are so many on a plant like this with its shape and scraping everything off to make sure that this infestation is over and that it doesn't start again. I think the insectocidal soap could definitely prevent future outbreaks, but I'll always have to keep my eyes peeled for any new infestations. I suppose these came from the wild, um, not from the potting mix, which I originally sterilized by baking before I started this series three years ago. So as you can see the leaf tips there are just chock full of this uh, disgusting crap. So everything requires treatment. I didn't want to trim away way too many leaves because that would uh, jeopardize the overall health of Josh, which is what I call my Joshua tree. Very logical choice. And I think we're basically done here. It's uh, been a lot of work, but I think it's well worth it to improve the aesthetics and put my mind at ease that I'm not going to lose my three-year-old Joshua tree. I think with a new soil, the clay loam thrown in there on top, eventually the potting mix will be completely replaced and the health of the plant will improve dramatically. Hopefully it'll grow faster, although I'm still limited by the amount of sunlight this receives. I can't provide a full sun environment in the wild in places like Joshua Tree National Park. And Joshua trees typically grow on a flat plateau or, or valley floor just full of sun, um, not really near uh, mountains or on 
hillsides, uh, mostly just flat ground is where I see them. So that must be the conditions that they like in open sun. They're spaced pretty far apart from each other, so there's really nothing that blocks light from getting to them. So thanks for watching, and please stay tuned for new episodes. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. It's day 1082. This episode covers the following nine weeks after the last episode, which was mostly about getting rid of those scale insects, that infestation that I had. So hopefully that's a thing of the past. I got this idea of using fruit peels and of course I eat a lot of bananas so why not use banana peels and cut them up into squares and wedges and triangles and whatnot to increase the surface area a little bit and to make it not as unsightly. So I cut off the tips where it's very hard and cut the peels into all these uh, various shapes randomly as you see and I'm going to place them around. Hopefully they'll decompose very quickly and when I water from the top the nutrients will get in so I have a layer of clay soil on top and beneath that is probably 90 percent potting mix so in previous episodes I mentioned that the potting mix volume decreased over time so hopefully this strategy pays off because uh, after that scale insect infestation I haven't seen that much growth so it's time for some new ideas. So it's day 1085 and I thought well those squares aren't decomposing very quickly at all. I mean they've shriveled up, they've turned black a little bit, they've oxidized. But what if I were to blend some banana peels in a blender with some water? Would that um, increase the rate of decomposition by many many fold and get the nutrients in there faster and also look better at the same time? So I decided to get some banana peels. I cut off the hard parts as I did previously with the squares and the wedges. And I'm adding some water in. I don't know how much to add. I've never done any of this before. So I press the liquefy button on my blender. And as you can see the banana peel smoothie is oxidizing before our very eyes. It's happening really really fast. This is on fast forward. But even so, you can see how fast color is changing just by air bubbles mixing in there that have oxygen and that's reacting with some of the compounds in there that have a greatly increased surface area now. So the first order of business is to pick off all this old organic detritus, including the leaves of, well, I guess I will leave them there, but um, I figure they'll get buried anyway so that's not a big deal those leaves from that wild weed from where I dug up this clay soil can stay in there they'll get buried so I won't be looking at them all the time so this banana peel smoothie is much harder to spread out than I thought it would be it's not as difficult as peanut butter but it's very viscous and foamy it makes a huge mess and it's not really dispersing and getting diluted by this distilled water that I'm pouring on. So it's day 1089. The Madana Peel smoothie formed a thick leathery layer. It's almost all black now. And there are areas where it's cracked. That's to be expected because at some point this had to dry out with the sun beating on it for three days or whatever. So this is not quite what I expected, but I think it'll get the job done. As you can see, I'm looking at those uh, weed leaves again. It's amazing how long leaves can stay green from various plants, whether they're succulents or just regular leafy greens. Uh, these weed leaves are probably going to be green for forever and ever. So it's day 1093. And as far as I can tell, there's been a burst of new foliage growth, although burst is quite the strong word to use with such a slow-growing succulent plant as this yucca species but it seems like although it's a thick leathery layer on top the banana peel smoothie is actually pretty porous and water doesn't just accumulate and only go down the edges it seems like it just goes straight through in relatively short order so as you can see I think there's a decent amount of new foliage growth so it's day 1100 
I'm still paranoid about scale insects. I'm afraid I may have missed some spots. And as far as I've noticed, this cluster of new leaves in the middle have grown considerably by all the standards that I have in the past when it comes to how slow this thing grows. So five days later, I was thinking, well, what about a mango peel and mango seed smoothie instead? Because the banana peel might be a little deficient in certain nutrients. So I was thinking a mango seed is a huge seed. It's probably the biggest seed that I regularly deal with in all the fruits that I regularly consume. And that should have a complete nutrition set for developing mango seedlings. So why not just blend that up and whatever peels I have. Although there is a downside. Uh, the peels have a bit of fruit flesh, mango flesh to them and I'm thinking that might attract bugs. In fact, I did read that banana peels can attract German cockroaches. That's one of the things they use as bait. So that's a horrible thought, but I haven't really noticed that many bugs. Hopefully that won't be a problem going forward. And I definitely have noticed growth every day or every few days. Anytime you can notice Joshua tree growth with your eyes just as the days pass is a very very good sign as you can see this water is not mixing with this mango seed and peel uh, slash fruit flesh smoothie at all but I'm sure after it dries out and it becomes more porous hopefully it will be so it's day 1112 and I moved to a new apartment so you may have already seen this in some of my other concurrent video updates a plant growing series and this is where I've put my Joshua tree for the time being. Seems to be doing really well. I put this pot in my car and drove over. It's in the same apartment complex but in a different unit. So now my balcony is in a courtyard. It's got beautiful landscaping plants and it faces east. So I get maybe four and a half hours of direct sun in the morning. It's not as harsh but as you can see that cookie on top is full of mold. So it's day 1125. I overwatered recently. The top is now very porous. It's a mango smoothie on top of a banana peel smoothie. Well, it doesn't really have that much mango fruit flesh, but this is a very tedious process. I bought these, a box of 50 or so of these uh, 15 ml hand pipettes and I'm seeing if I could just transfer that water that probably contains a lot of nutrients and dead bugs to the caked on mango and banana peel smoothies on top so that way I don't need to use new water and any nutrients that got into the watering tray can be recycled up there but as you can see this is really tedious and I would just recommend not watering that much in the first place so it's day 1141 and I've decided I want to remove these dual smoothie layers caked on top. They've become really really foul and vile. So look at all that mold on top especially where the sun is facing. That's weird. I thought that there would be more mold on the other side and I don't have a zoom in at this point but there are all these translucent worms that also showed up in my raspberry cutting series pot and you can see all these uh, fungus gnats and things just writhing around. So basically they were living on the underside of that banana peel layer which was on the bottom. So I decided why not try just putting in straight mango seed smoothie instead. No fruit peels which I think are nasty and that won't have any of that attached banana and fruit flesh such as mango fruit because that stuff really attracts bugs. At first I thought it might just be fruit flies, but I saw some pesky gnats or tiny flies, and who knows what laid those worms in there. Maybe the worms were from the wild clay soil that I brought in. I would say within about 30 seconds to a minute, all those translucent worms burrow deeper into the clay soil. They're heading for deeper ground for protection otherwise they're going to dry out. But I was just amazed at how many various uh, worms or maybe even maggots were down there. 
they're definitely not anything that belongs to uh, fruit flies or anything that I'm familiar with. So I'm picking through my bag of frozen seeds and I'm going to show you and blend some of these seeds that are more pristine, ones that I would have used for starting a new mango growing series if I had to. And here goes another seed in there. I added a total of four. But as you can see, this stuff doesn't oxidize before our eyes. It's very runny and watery. It sort of forms a pile of sediment at the bottom, but not too much. So there's various things in these seeds, and I'm sure there's lipids and other things like proteins that really make the composition very different from fruit peels and things like that, which contain wax and uh, stuff that I'm sure insects like to eat more. I'm not sure if insects want to eat mango seed smoothies without anything else in them. So here's another seed that's in good shape. The flesh is again a white beige-ish color. Oh, this one looks a little bit more yellow. But you don't want to start a mango growing series with the seeds that have uh, blackened areas on them. Bruises. I don't know how they get like that but I've opened a lot of mango seed coats and I've seen a lot where they seem sort of ghoulish. They've got grayish uh, regions inside. Maybe that's just some kind of rot. I can't imagine that that would be any kind of oxidation. So I think this is a good first test for seeds going into this um, with one liter of water. It doesn't seem like the volumes increase due to foam or anything like that. So it's a pretty good consistency. It'll be a lot easier to pour. Pure mango seed smoothies are like powdered milk. And powdered milk is a little bit different in consistency. Well, actually quite different from real milk. So I'm adding slightly half of the four blended seeds here. I added a slightly under half to the raspberry cuttings pot. So that's a smaller pot and Josh is going to be around for much longer compared to that series so I'm not saying the other series is going to end I mean it's just getting going right now and it's going to fruit at some point I feel so it won't go on forever but I'll be keeping Josh around for a very very long time uh, never say forever but hopefully one day I can transplant Josh into the ground somewhere so the first smoothie made from four good seeds didn't cut it it doesn't cover everything so here comes half of the other eight seeds that I blended from that bag of frozen mango seeds these are seeds that I wouldn't start a mango growing series with and what I mean by that is just right out of the seed coat they have grayish zones and discolorations uh, typically black zones that will spread if you try to incubate and grow them even in the most sterile conditions using hydrogen peroxide in a closed container so right now I'm spinning this pot around because the balcony itself is a little lower near the rail and it's higher uh, more towards the sliding door and that's designed that way so water will flow off the balcony in case it rains or some flooding event happens uh, whether it's from the water heater or me pouring water on the floor of the balcony so as you can see this eight seed smoothie uh, consisting of bad mango seeds that I wouldn't use to plant new mango seedlings from. This has a darker consistency. It's more of a darker beige tan. But that's okay after mixing all this together. Um, the color is actually a great match for the color of the pot and it forms a great contrast with the shadow from the blades. So it looks like a sundial going in all these different directions. It dried out under just a few minutes and it sort of looks like a salt flat. This whole picture sort of reminds me of the Smithsonian logo. So it's uh, quite a sight. It's much more interesting than looking at just clay soil or some kind of potting mix. So I'm fairly confident that this will be a lot safer in terms of not attracting so many pests. This mango seed only puree or smoothie as opposed to any kind of smoothie that has fruit peels, banana peels, mango peels in it, that fruit flesh uh, probably ferments and it attracts a lot of bugs. 
So mostly airborne pests that come in here, flies, gnats, uh, laying their eggs. There's also things that were in that clay soil that I brought in from the wild, so who knows what kind of eggs were latent in there and what kind of molds were in there. Well, you saw a lot of the mold, and I'm still surprised that it grew towards the sun instead of away from it in the shadows. So as you can see, there's a lot of new blades being pumped out. That's what I want to see, uh, constant uh, growth. I don't want to see the new blades ever stall out. So with succulents, always look to the center to see if new blades are coming out, if everything stalls and the new stuff is all dead or yellow or brown, then your plant is pretty much a goner or on its way to dying. Thank you for watching and please stay tuned to my YouTube channel for further updates.